Hello and welcome to Audio Medical Basics, where I read medical books to your ears when your hands are too busy to hold a book. Um, we'll continue today with our case files collection, internal medicine book with another case. Last time with viral hepatitis, and this time the case will be about cirrhosis, liver cirrhosis. And let's start with the case. A 49-year-old woman presents with new onset abdominal swelling. Her history reveals a blood transfusion with postpartum hemorrhage and cocaine use. On examination, her temperature is 100.3 degree Fahrenheit, which is 37.9 degrees centigrade. Her abdomen is distended with mild diffuse tenderness, shifting dullness to percussion, and a fluid wave consistent with ascites. She has no peripheral edema. Um, laboratory studies show the following levels. Sodium 129 millimole per liter, albumin 2.8 milligram per deciliter, prothrombin time is 15 seconds, hemoglobin is 12 grams per deciliter, with MCV, mean corpuscular volume, 102 femtoliters, and platelet count 78,000 per cubic millimeter. So the first question is, what is the most likely diagnosis? The most likely diagnosis is ascites caused by portal hypertension as a complication of hepatic cirrhosis in this case. What is the next step in this case? Perform a paracentesis to evaluate the ascitic fluid to try to determine its likely etiology as well as evaluate for the complication of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. All right. So objectives of this case is to know the causes of chronic hepatitis, especially hepatitis C virus, to learn the complications of chronic hepatitis, just as, such as cirrhosis and portal hypertension, understand the utility of the serum ascites albumin gradient, SAAG, SAG, to differentiate causes of ascites, and to know how the and to know how to diagnose the spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So considerations. This 49-year-old woman had been in good health until recently when she noted increasing abdominal swelling and discomfort indicative of ascites. The physical examination is, is consistent with ascites with the fluid wave and shifting dullness. Her icterus suggest liver disease as the etiology of ascites. Uh, let's note in this case, uh, the, the patient's blood pressure was 94 over 60 millimeter mercury and her sclerae were, were ecteric. So her, the ecterus in this case suggests liver disease as the etiology of ascites. Her laboratory studies are significant for hypoalbuminemia and coagulopathy by prolonged prothrombin time, indicating probable impaired hepatic synthetic function and advanced liver disease. She does have prior exposures, most notably a blood transfusion, which put her at risk for hepatitis viruses, especially hepatitis C. Currently, she also has a low-grade fever and mild abdominal tenderness, both signs of infection. Bacterial infection of the ascitic fluid must be considered because untreated cases have a high mortality. Although a large majority of patients with ascites and jundice have cirrhosis, other etiologies of ascites must be considered, including malignancy, thus paracentesis using a needle introduced through the skin into the peritoneal cavity can be used to assess for infection as well as to seek an etiology for of the ascites. So, approach to clinical hepatitis. Definitions. Ascites is abnormal accumulation of fluid within the peritoneal cavity. Abnormal accumulation of fluid, which is more than 25 milliliters within the peritoneal cavity. Chronic hepatitis 
is evidence of hepatic inflammation and necrosis for at least six months. Cirrhosis, histologic diagnosis, reflecting irreversible chronic hepatic injury, which includes extensive fibrosis and formation of regenerative nodules. Definition of portal hypertension. Portal hypertension is increased pressure gradient in the portal vein, more than 10 mm mercury, usually resulting from resistance to portal flow and most commonly caused by cirrhosis. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is bacterial infection of ascytic fluid without any interabdominal source of infection. Occurs in 10% to 20% of cirrhotic patients with ascites. Clinical approach. Okay. Chronic hepatitis is diagnosed when patients have evidence of hepatic inflammation and necrosis, usually found by elevated transaminases for at least six months. The most common causes of chronic hepatitis are viral infections such as hepatitis B and C, alcohol use, chronic exposure to other drugs or toxins, and autoimmune hepatitis. Less common causes are inherited metabolic disorders such as hemochromatosis, Wilson disease, or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Hepatitis C infection is most commonly acquired through percutaneous exposure to blood. It also can be transmitted through exposure to other body fluids. Risk factors for acquisition of hepatitis C include, include intravenous drug use, sharing of straws to snort cocaine, hemodialysis, blood transfusion, tattooing, and piercing. Piercing. In contrast to hepatitis B, sexual transmission is rare. Vertical transmission, vertical transmission from mother to child is uncommon, but occurs more often when the mother has high viral titers or is HIV positive. Okay. Most patients diagnosed with hepatitis C are asymptomatic and report no prior history of acute hepatitis. The, cl the clinician must have a high index of suspicion and offer screening to those individuals with risk factors for infection. Methods for detecting infection include ELISA test, which detects anti-hepatitis C virus antibody, or PCR to detect hepatitis C virus RNA. Approximately 70% to 80% of all patients infected with hepatitis C will develop chronic hepatitis in the 10 years following infection. Within 20 years, 20% 20 of those will develop cirrhosis. Among those with cirrhosis, 1% to 4% to 4 annually may develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Therapy is directed toward reducing the viral load to prevent the sequelae of end-stage cirrhosis, liver failure, and hepatocellular carcinoma. The treatment of choice for chronic hepatitis was a combination therapy of interferon and ribavirin. However, the therapy had many side effects such as influenza-like symptoms and depression with interferon and hemolysis with ribavirin. However, new treatments called direct-acting antivirals, DAAs, are now the standard of care for treating hepatitis C. This is largely because they have been shown to be more effective than interferons and to cause fewer side effects. So as I said, this is uh, this update from healthline.com from 2019. Cirrhosis is the end result of chronic hepatocellular injury that leads to both fibrosis and nodular regeneration. With ongoing hepatocyte destruction and collagen deposition, deposition, the liver shrinks in size and becomes nodular and hard. Alcoholic cirrhosis is one of the most common forms of cirrhosis encountered in the United States. It is related to chronic alcohol use, but there appears to be some hereditary predisposition to the development of fibrosis. 
and the process is enhanced by concomitant infection with hepatitis C. Clinical symptoms are produced by the hepatic dysfunction as well as by portal hypertension, which is produced by increased resistance to portal blood flow, producing portal hypertension and sometimes to resultant portosystemic shunting. Loss of functioning hepatic mass leads to jaundice as well as impaired synthesis of albumin and of clothing factors. So impaired synthesis of albumin and impaired synthesis of clothing factors. Impaired synthesis of albumin leading to edema and impaired synthesis of clothing factors leading to coagulopathy. Fibrosis and increased sinusoidal resistance lead to portal hypertension and its complication such as esophageal varices, ascites and hypersplenism and hypersplenism portosystemic shunting via natural collaterals or iatrogenic shunts causes hepatic encephalopathy portal hypertension causes caput medusa and hemorrhoids decreased liver production of a steroid hormone binding globulin SHBG, steroid hormone binding globulin, decreased liver production of this SHBG leads to an increase in unbound estrogen manifested by spider angiomata, palmar erythema, and gynecomastia in men. Hepatic encephalopathy is characterized by mental status changes, asterixes, and elevated ammonia levels. So this is all for part one. In part two, we'll continue and we'll speak about the ascites. And also we'll read tables about the differential diagnosis of ascites and another table for the complications of cirrhosis and the clinical pearls. Thank you very much for listening. And please uh, share, like, and subscribe. Um, until me, nothing just share like and subscribe and uh, thank you very much for listening and see you in part two inshallah